I know David knows a lot of these, and I've had quite a couple most of our testicles, um, and most of our genitals, some when he's had his medical license, actually. Um, <laughs> David is an, ama he's an amazing guy. He's an amazing friend. We did a show together. We started doing an addiction show together. I don't even remember how we met each other, how we were hooked up to do this addiction show. What I realized is when you confront addiction with a family member, with yourself, um, what you need is options, because it feels like you're being you know, dunked underwater and being held underwater and you're flailing and you don't know which way is up. And the book is about that, the, the solution to addiction, the way to look at it uh, and to give people some hope that they don't have to be trapped in that one way of thinking. You know, he, rehab's great, AA is great, but he brings to it a whole other set of values and options that just, I mean, they saved my life and he continues to help me in that way. So he's a gift He's a gift to me, and he's a gift to all of us, and the book is, is magnificent. He's a great doctor, and I, I don't let anybody see me naked other than him. Maybe my wife during an eclipse or something, but uh, <laughs> Dr. David Kipper. Rodney Dangerfield had a very funny line. He said, I don't actually like cocaine, I just like the way it smells. And he's, he's not alone. There are a hundred million people in America that have addiction problems. And these problems are behavioral, they're substance. And what's interesting and what was interesting to me when we started this book, if it's such a popular disease, why have we failed so miserably at fixing this or treating this? And there are a number of reasons. One is that doctors generally are not trained in this. It's probably 10 to 20 percent of med schools teach addiction uh, to their students. One half of one percent of doctors actually treat addiction. So if you think about how popular, if that's a good word, this disease is, and you think about how few professionals are there to help, it's, it's pretty amazing. Also, treating addiction addicts are not easy patients. Uh, it requires a team of people to treat addiction. It requires behavioralists, it requires medical people, it requires pharmacologists, um, and it's so doctors are not used to working in that kind of a paradigm. They're not used to working with other people. Ego sort of get in the way. And so in order to really treat this disease, you have to establish these networks of people. And everybody's different. Every person that has an addiction is different. So you have to factor in those differences, and then you have to find professionals that are willing to work like that. But the science now backs us up. We have the genetic code has been cracked. We understand there are several gene markers for addiction. Uh, there's probably a dozen now, and there'll probably be another dozen you know, in another six months. But we can actually identify people that have a, a predisposition to cocaine problems, alcohol problems. and. There are brain scans, there are MRIs, there are imaging studies that actually can pick people out of the crowd that have addictive potential. There's a family history that's very uh, telling with this disease, so you just look up your family tree and you can get a good feeling about where, where this is coming and who's vulnerable. Addiction is a dual diagnosis disease, and what that means is that for over a hundred years we've been treating this disease as as an addiction as the problem. The addiction is really secondary, and it's secondary to the primary problem, which is brain chemistry, which is the mental health issue that goes along with the imbalanced brain chemistry. And just to make this simple, if there are three basic neurotransmitters that we have. There's serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline. If you have too little serotonin, you're going to be depressed, and you're going to have some OCD. If you have too little dopamine, you're going to be, uh, you're going to have a focusing problem. You may have a bipolar disorder, depending on the degree of that disorder. And then if you have an imbalance in noradrenaline, you're going to be nervous and anxious and panicky. And that's what these chemicals in the brain do. That's how they express their behavior. So when these imbalances are stressed, they go way out of whack. And people feel really bad, and they self-medicate. And if you self-medicate with the wrong things, you get an addiction. And that's how this all happens. So addiction is based in brain chemistry. It's determined by our genetics, and it is triggered by stress. It's really very simple. The drugs actually choose us. If you have an imbalance in serotonin, you don't have enough, and you tend to be a little OCD or a little depressed, 
the drugs that make you feel better are opiates and alcohol because when you take those drugs, they temporarily give you a little bump in serotonin so you feel better. So pretty soon your brain gets used to the idea that when you're not feeling good, Stephen talked a little bit about the reward, the reward system in the brain. Those are the drugs that you go after. People often wonder, well, why is it that I can't drink, but I can do a line of cocaine every once in a while, or vice versa, or why is it that I smoke cigarettes, but I don't do heroin? That's why. These drugs actually choose us based on our imbalances. I've used this little gimmick, uh, Peter and I, on the radio, and I've used it in my practice. It's called the addiction prediction. This is not based in science, so this is based on my experience. And Ted's going to pass these things out. It takes you about a minute and a half to fill this out. And what these cards, what this does is that the circle is divided into three parts. And each part represents a different neurotransmitter. One is serotonin, one is dopamine, one is noradrenaline. You answer these questions, you, you fill in the circle, when it's a yes answer, and then at the end of this, you'll find that you're going to clump answers in one of these parts of the circle. And then when you turn it over, you'll see which areas correspond to which neurotransmitters. So for instance, if you end up in the red uh, when you get this, you have a serotonin problem, possibly. And if you have a serotonin problem, you're predisposed to alcohol and opiates. If you have a dopamine problem, you're predisposed to stimulants, cocaine, methamphetamine. And if you have a noradrenaline problem, you're predisposed to anything that makes you less anxious, benzos, marijuana, nicotine. So it's a really simplistic and simple test, but uh, it will actually give you some reference as to what you picked out of your family tree. The future of addiction is very interesting. We're going to see vaccines. We have a vaccine for cocaine that's coming out in a couple of years. Very interesting. They took a cold virus and they figured out what part of that rhinovirus, it's a cold virus, stimulates the immune response to produce an antibody. The antibody comes and attacks the virus. That's how you get better. So they took the part of the virus that provokes the immune response and then they tagged it with a little thing that looks like to the body cocaine. And they injected this into rats. Rats develop these antibodies. And so now when the rat would take cocaine, which in itself is sort of a funny image, <laughs> the, the cocaine would be destroyed before it ever got to the brain. So now they're figuring this out for humans, but it's the same principle. The drugs are getting smarter. Uh, the vaccines are available. There's going to be a blood panel, very much like a cholesterol panel. There'll be a blood panel for addiction where we'll be able to isolate the genetics. We'll be able to isolate the neurotransmitter imbalances. And so pretty soon, just like you go to the doctor to find out whether you need Lipitor, you're going to go in and find out if you need Prozac or if you need some behavioral changes that will help you with that. Finally, I hope that we have some preventative measures in this country. So we really owe it to our kids to educate them about this, to just teach them these very simple things so that when they get exposed to these drugs, and they all do in junior high school and high school, if they understand how this works and they understand that they have some resources and hopefully there'll be more people treating this disease. So that's it. The book was a lot of fun to write. I think that there's um, there's a lot of information in there, um, and it was a really wonderful experience to do this with Stephen. And I, I, I like treating addiction. Addiction is a, it's sort of a mind-body disease. It incorporates not only the emotional, but the physical. And actually, when you treat other chronic medical diseases like diabetes and heart disease and cancer, you're putting Band-Aids on people most of the time. You can actually fix somebody with an addiction, you can actually restore their lives, and uh, it's a very rewarding feeling when it works. So, thank you for coming. And